our first question from Leanne Ernster. It says, a new 192nd Avenue bridge is the answer. I'd be encouraging, it would be encouraging for our city to see Tim Levitt appear for these important events rather than let the people lead without him. The question, when will Tim Levitt step up and become an active participant in solutions and people-oriented action rather than task-oriented defense responses? We'll have to save that one for the mayor. All right, consecutive ones here. This one's from Matt Ernster. Why is it that our elected officials are not fully aware of the outrageous costs that we as the people would have to pick up the tab? Why are our elected officials not listening to the voices of the people? Why is there no financial accountability in the CRC project? You want to discuss that one a little bit? Again, when, when we examine policy, what we're looking at is how, uh, how uh, incentives are aligned, which is one reason that, that we like to bring private competition, managed competition into public projects because uh, people respond to incentives. And I think in this case, public officials are making the calculation, and I don't know what the details of politics are, but they don't, if you're an elected official and you don't see a downside to supporting a light rail project or the spending that goes with it, you're going to support it. If you see that there's a movement against it and it will lead to trouble in your next re-election, then you're going to tend to be against it. So I think it just depends on how the political incentives are aligned when it comes to uh, working on this project. Just to give you some idea of how dysfunctional uh, oversight of state agencies is from the legislature, and I use the word oversight loosely here, <clears throat> the appropriations process down in Salem is something that I participate in sometimes. And when ODOT had their budget up for review by the particular subcommittee of the full committee, <clears throat> we're talking days of meetings, two, two or three hour meetings, to look at the budget, and then at some point there's a public hearing where anybody can come in and testify. And what usually happens is special interest groups like the truckers and the AAA and others, they all come in and bless the budget and say what a great job is going on. And legislators admit that they have these three ring binders of stuff which they don't really understand. And I knew, I knew all this, and so I wanted to give them something where they weren't just stage managed, something where they could actually make a policy choice. <clears throat> So I went through the ODOT budget and I picked out a couple things that I knew to be totally discretionary because a lot of the money is, is dedicated. And I said, well, here's an item. For six years now, you've been running this program called Drive Less, Save More. It costs about $2, $2 million in the biennium coming up. And I said, you've been doing it for six years. Don't you think we've already said everything you can possibly say about Drive Less, Save More? So can't we just euthanize this program and free up $2 million? This is FHWA, federal money that comes in, is called flex funds. It can be used for anything they want. I said, you're the legislature. Why don't you kill off this goofy little program and free up $2 million for some other purpose? Any other purpose, I don't care. Just be a legislature. Well, the front page of the Oregonian, there was a story three days ago of a freshman legislator who actually followed up on that a month later, tried to do it. Uh, total pushback, and in the work session the other day, he was the lone vote against the ODOT budget because the decision makers and legislature have decided, for other reasons, that this program must continue. I thought, wow, if you can't kill this program, how are you as legislators ever going to kill anything, or how are you even going to act like legislators and take control of the bureaucracy? It, it's sad. And I don't think the Oregon legislature is unique in this regard. Is this on? Okay. Well, first of all, many of you know that I've been speaking out with concerns about this project. Um, there is another $25 million in the transportation budget uh, that was passed by the Washington State Legislature this year. Uh, unfortunately, the, we vote on the budget as a, as a total. 
So we don't necessarily vote on a single project. Um, I did actually try to take some of that money uh, out of the uh, CRC portion and try to use it someplace that would actually do us some good. Um, based on what I've heard today from, from Ms. Couch, um, this week I'm going to be calling the state auditor and perhaps even the state attorney general to look into what's going on with, with the CRC. I, I want to make sure that, that they are being audited on a regular basis. Um, our state auditor is, is required to audit over, I think, 2,300 uh, government entities within the state uh, to do financial audits. Um, all the counties, all the cities, uh, school districts, any taxing district can be subject to an audit. Um, so I, I need to make sure that uh, the CRC is falling under that too and make sure that the, uh, the state auditor is, is following through on that. Uh, I may even request that there be a performance audit on the CRC, although I think we all know how that would turn out, uh, that they're not performing. Um, <laughs> if I may, I'd like to just make a few remarks regarding this, this whole project um, and concerns that I've had about it uh, for a number of years. Uh, first of all, uh, last year I sat through a finance committee meeting in the, in the state legislature with the city of Hoquiam, population 8,700, uh, came to the legislature and they were saying that um, they need a third bridge. 8,700 people, they need a third bridge. I look at Cowlitz County and the Cowlitz River. Uh, in about 15 miles, if you travel up I-5, about 15 miles worth, um, you will find that there are five different crossings across the Cowlitz River for a county with a population of 100,000. Here we sit in Clark County with a population of over 400,000, a million and a half or so across the river. We're looking at roughly a metropolitan area of, of roughly two million people, and somehow people think this can be done with two bridges. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Uh, in a discussion with um, Don Wagner of the DOT a few years ago, um, I don't think he realized, but he is the one who actually inadvertently convinced me that a third bridge was necessary. Uh, and he did so by talking about how so much traffic comes into the I-5 corridor at SR-500, 4th Plain, Mill Plain, and SR-14. And he stated that the reason we, why we needed two of the lanes on the bridge was for that traffic to dump off at Jansen Beach. So my question to him is, well, why don't we just build a third bridge and not bring that traffic into the corridor in the first place? Uh, and that pretty well set it in stone as to, to what my position was. Um, I think the 192nd Avenue is, is definitely a, a, a reasonable approach. I think something maybe um, closer to Lisa Road, um, just before you drop down off the heights uh, and down onto the flats coming in uh, by Pearson Field would be a good place to take off and put traffic into um, Jansen Beach without having to come onto I-5. Um, I think there are opportunities to do that. I just think it needs to be studied a little further uh, and, and worked on. And then certainly a, a west bypass that perhaps comes off at Main Street, um, maybe uh, do some realignment of the intersection at, at Main Street and 39th uh, and get some of the, the truck traffic. It's an, it's an easy off-ramp there for, for trucks. Give them an easy transition onto 39th, get them down to the port, um, and put a crossing over to Oregon there. So there are three viable options for a, a, a third bridge that would get congestion off of the I-5 corridor uh, and solve a lot of the problems. One of the really big problems that I see uh, with doing uh, five lanes each way, God forbid they ever went with six, is they just expanded Delta Park from, from two lanes to three. And it seems to me if they had any intention whatsoever of expanding that to four, they would have already done it when they were expanding it to three. So it tells me that that is a long, long, long way in the future and is highly unlikely to happen. And it would be extremely expensive for them to do. Uh, you also have choke points at Lombard with uh, additional traffic coming in. You have choke points at the Rose Quarter. Uh, we've heard today about choke points at Highway 26, which is one of the reasons why you need to bypass and to, and to get people across the river before they ever get to, uh, to the I-5 crossing. So there's, there's a lot of evidence that clearly shows something different has to be done than 
what really, in effect, is a boondoggle. Uh, I, I can't really call it anything else. Um, light rail uh, is, it, it just takes up space. We saw that today. It takes up space, doesn't provide um, lanes. Uh, and what I thought was really interesting is, is we saw on that, that section of, of 205 where you saw the backup of vehicles. It was a constant stream of vehicles, and there wasn't a light rail train anywhere on those tracks. And that just tells me that that is just wasted space that is not being used adequately. And more lane miles is actually what's going, going to solve a lot of our congestion problems. <laughs> tolls. Um, I grew up on the East Coast. I grew up with tolls, so I'm not opposed to tolls. My concern here with tolls is that Washington residents would pay a disproportionate share than what Oregon would. And, and sitting in one of the meetings that I sat in, um, a lot of the, the uh, infrastructure that is going to be uh, built is going to be south of the bridge. And there are going to be a lot of Oregonians who are going to be able to use that infrastructure that Washingtonians are paying for and never have to pay a cent in tolls. And that is just absolutely unfair to the citizens of this state. And I will not stand by and, or sit by quietly uh, and allow that to happen. I'm going to continue to speak out against it for that reason. <laughs> Finally, I want to talk about the countywide vote that, that there's been um, concerns about. Uh, as many of you know, I wrote a letter to, um, to the county commissioners, and I do want to apologize to the county commissioners for them receiving it from a third party. Um, we, we put it in the mail to them, and then we... we uh, email the copy of it to the constituent who requested that we do so. And without the constituent, the constituent didn't realize we'd put the other one in the mail, and so he forwarded it. And so um, it was accidentally received by the uh, commissioners uh, through the constituent rather than us. So it's, I do wish to, again, publicly apologize to the county commissioners for, for them receiving it that way. Um, but there was a, we, we found a, a potential opportunity or a potential method uh, for the county commissioners to do a countywide vote. Uh, it may not be the best way to do it, uh, but it just shows that there are, there are ways that the county can do it uh, to get an advisory vote. Um, after I sent the letter, I, you know, I, I continued to think on this and thought, you know, if CTRAN would just return the district to a countywide district rather than the sub-district they've created, then everybody would get a chance to vote on it anyway. Uh, it was gerrymandered in the first place and never should have been. And now we're seeing in the news that, that CTRAN is, is looking at um, gerrymandering a sub-district of what I consider to already be a sub-district of, of Clark County. So they're very clearly trying to gerrymander this thing very simply for one reason, and that's to get it down to where they can get a 50% plus one vote in favor of light rail, despite what the majority of the county wants and despite who the majority is that'll actually be paying those taxes. So those are my concerns with the project. I'll continue to, to work with all of you uh, and continue to try and make sure that we have whatever project we have actually solves congestion, does it in an affordable manner, and is, is paid for fairly on both sides of the river, not entirely by folks on this side. Thank you.